So, infrastructure is destiny. Um, my husband made, made up this sentence, and I thought, wow, it is so true. So, when we built Levitt Town, we then had to do the highways, and so what did we get? Inexorably, because of that infrastructure, we got this, and we had these obesity rates. The one led to the other. Infrastructure is destiny. So I was thinking about car travel, and when we do car travel, as our primary mode, everything is point to point. Where can I get in 30 minutes? That's kind of how I evaluate things. And so then our cities, this is Phoenix, became very generic places, because where can I get point to point? I'm starting to evaluate based on the smallest possible unit, my house. So any one of these houses is pretty much like getting any other one of those houses. It's all based on the fact that I'm just making my decision based on just the house, because I do everything by car. I was also thinking about humans and human nature as our innate infrastructure. And our innate infrastructure is basically that we favor things that are convenient and easy and cheap. We've spent the last hundred years specifically and proactively making personal cars easy and cheap. And I think of this as our economic infrastructure. And that's, you know, taxes and regulatory. And we've done everything to make personal car ownership easy and cheap over the last hundred years. So we've been underpricing air pollution and curb access and congestion. And even in this country specifically, just basic transport infrastructure. We've been underpricing all of those things. And this is how we make our decisions. So if I own a private car, when I think about what's it going to cost to go someplace, I think only about the marginal cost. You guys remember this. You know, what's the cost of gas? Do I have to pay for parking and tolls? That is your entire decision is based on that. And think of all the underpricing that is happening embedded in that as it stands. And when we do shared modes, something I really loved about Zipcar is I want ice cream. If I own my own car, I think, oh yeah, whatever, it's like 50 cents to go get some ice cream. If, I, if I'm renting a shared vehicle, I'm saying, whoa, that's gonna be 10 to $12 an hour to buy that ice cream. You know what? Maybe I'm going to eat the stale cookies and on my way home from work, I'll buy ice cream. So when we go from personal modes to shared modes, we go from marginal assessment to full cost assessment. Technology has made this sharing equation incredibly easy, and that's been its delight. And so Zipcar, yep, because of technology, we were able to make it make, take 30 seconds to get into the car. We can think about all those transport apps, transit apps that have made it possible for me in cities I don't know. You know, so I'm in London, and I can actually take a bus because I know where to get on, I know where to get off. It's now possible to do that. And we can think about the e-hailing, and much more interestingly, the actual ride-sharing version of this, it's all because we have smartphones and GPS and seamless payments that we've now, within touching, recent, touching distance of getting real-time ride-sharing in urban areas. Like, it actually is happening, maybe not as much as we want, but I feel like we're at the top end of the funnel. How many people can we get putting in their origin and their destination and their time so we can start matching more trips? But, yes, indeed, there is a very dark side. This is Regina Chertow's um, work. And so what would you do if e-hailing or ride-sharing services did not exist? And, you know, depending on who I'm talking to, there's so much to talk to about in this. So 21% of the people would drive themselves. In my view, that's exactly the same. Driving yourself or taking a Lyft or an Uber, so what? And in fact, I would say, actually, taking a Lyft or Uber means I don't have to have a parked car that's being stored for 97% of the time on the street, so maybe it's even better. If you're thinking about, if you're a transit authority, you're saying, oh my god, it's taking us off of rail and transit. True, that's a terrible thing. I was really struck when I saw this by the fact that 24% of the people are taking ride-hailing apps instead of walking or biking. Remember how lazy we are innately? It is now <laughs> being expressed right here that I would rather walk I would rather not walk. And then um, over Christmas time, because I'd think about this day and night, my husband was pointing out to me that um, Amazon had a thousand items that they would deliver to your house in two hours. And this is kind of a terrifying, you know, tagline. What you want before you want it. So if you go to our inner selves who love things that are really easy and really convenient, you know the direction we are going. It is terrifying. So the next new technology to come along, self-driving cars. How amazing. But in a world of self-driving cars, 
When you take away the cost of my body and my time, or the cost of a driver, the single most expensive thing in that car, we never even used to think about our time as a cost, but it is now, all of those things that we hated, all of those underpricing things that were terrible, air pollution, curb access, congestion, transport infrastructure, all of that is about to get way worse. All those things you hated are about to get way worse because we have now are inserting into our existing economic infrastructure regime something that is totally different costs. I was last week, I think, at Three Revolutions with a whole bunch of you guys, or some of you, and there were researchers there who were telling us that the cost to move an electric self-driving car is one and a half cents a mile. So I want to ask you, what would you not do with that car when it's a cent, one and a half cents a mile to move it in marginal cost? Um, my best metaphor right now to get you thinking about what would you do with this item is think about cameras on smartphones. When they first put the camera in the smartphone, you think, whatever, you know, I take photographs at birthday parties and on vacation. Suddenly, are we not taking photos like 25 times a day for all these different use cases? So when you have your personal car for which you're only paying marginal costs and it's costing you a penny and a half a mile to move that thing, what would you not do with it? It is our personal slaves. It is a slave, and it's going to do our bidding anywhere. Um, just if you're not terrified enough, just think about your personal use cases, um, I'm thinking back to retail. So today, in the retail environment, I want, to be, I want to have my shop on that main street, and I pay a lot of rent for that. Or I don't have the money, and so I put my store around the corner cheaper. Or I'm Amazon, and I have a warehouse outside. The future holds retail automated trips. And I was talking to a reporter, and I loved their headline, self-driving cars will fill the streets with rats. <laughs> so what's going to happen is we're going to have that same thing, and all of those streets, all of those stores, will now be warehousing their inventory on our public streets. And why not? It's so cheap. We, are, we just let them go for free. And so I found this nice Banksy thing, welcome to hell, for sure. But if we think about this, I think we can, many of us can agree that rats in cities are bad, but rats in the countryside, let's discuss, right? I don't know if they're bad. There could be lots of reasons why maybe this is a better future than at my in-law's house driving 35 minutes to go to the grocery store back. But we certainly have to have an informed, engaged public discussion and not just let it just happen to us. So, if we understand that people naturally choose cheap and easy, that infrastructure is destiny, and that autonomous vehicles are imminent, which we all know is the case, over the next five years, we all have this imperative. We need to specifically and proactively rework our physical and social and economic and data infrastructure to make shared and active transport easy and cheap. We have to completely reverse the tables that the last hundred years we've done all this stuff, working it out, and this new economic model and the new spatial model, I'm saying the old spatial model, and we're going to insert this new thing with a totally different economics associated. We have to redo it. We have to redo it. And so I had more slides here, but Jeff Tomlin stole them. So I'm just going to um, put this one. And so we know that urban planners, city planners around the world, and transport planners around the world say, oh my god, you need to put another level on top of that street. We've got to put that deck on top. Too congested. And here, of course, is the reality of 75% of the people alone in their cars. I like to see that again. It's impressive, isn't it? So, with these new cars, I feel like we are actually getting an opportunity to do over cities. And I've been working on this for quite a long time, and I'll try to paint some of this heaven vision. Um, specifically, in the last, uh, last year, I worked with 10 large world NGOs working in, in the city and transport space, and we said, what, is the, what, is this, what do we all agree on? We all agree that cities are moving, should be moving towards this multimodal, equitable, resource-efficient, economically, environmentally just city, and there are these 10 principles that I want to say for transport planners are basically motherhood and apple pie, but we need to be really clear about them, and so we were very, very clear about them. 
And incredibly, and I'm really proud to say that then I managed to finagle 15 of the world's largest passenger, shared passenger mobility guys to come together. They were producing 76 million trips a day to agree also with those principles. And so the goal over the next few years and hopefully over the next few months is to start getting cities, their advisors, the private sector, to all say, yeah, we are all in agreement. This is where we're going, and here's directionally how we get there. And so what are these principles? Um, these are then, and I'm gonna pull them out, a few of them, I'm not gonna go through all of them, and I would urge you all to go to sharedmobilityprinciples.org, and whatever your institution is, see if you can endorse and sign up. We've had a great number of people who've joined up later. So I'm just gonna go through these, a few of these. So my favorite one is number seven, fair user fees across all modes. It suddenly occurred to me that cities around the world are all saying, you know what? You could take your bike that has zero pollution and a really small footprint, or you could take your 25-year-old minivan that's disgusting. We don't care. We're ambivalent. That's the signal we are setting right now, that we don't care if you take your bike or you take this giant car that is spewing pollution. We don't care, which is not the case at all. And so I've been thinking, you know, I work with a lot of entrepreneurs and I've been an entrepreneur. So we say, what is the business model for bike sharing? And I think, yeah, it's really hard to deliver a business model of bike sharing because no one's paying for pollution and no one's paying for the extra space they take. How do we build a business model? And I also want to say, and they should be paying for their fair share of sidewalks as well. You know, when we have these dockless bikes. But if we started making fair user fees across all modes and leveling the, leveling the playing field, business models would result, taking us to the place that we want to go. Um, the other piece, these are just two notes to self, is right now the city of Chicago egregiously and Boston and um, New York City is about to do it, is throwing extra taxes on top of the TNCs. And I think, I was just having an actual argument with my city councilor, and he was saying, those TNCs, people are getting the TNCs instead of walking or biking or taking transit. And I said, and I'm driving my own car instead of walking, biking, and taking transit. It is exactly the same, 100% the same. So we need to have these fair user fees across all modes and stop picking out specific ones of them. Because when we go to this new future, we can't, we have to start changing the economic model. So this is from Bogota, I think, that someone drew up for me. So here you have all the people in their single occupancy vehicle, and there are the three people who are doing a fantastic job for society, crushed in their 30, 30 of them in a bus, moving nowhere, because the rest of us are incredibly unfair and selfish and kind of gross that we're doing this at this so, just fair user fees across all modes. I just stuck this slide in thanks to Jeff. Um, um, Nico and I have, I, I like, this, this would be my dream scenario. So, three types of fees. Number one, VMTs based on car type. So when you go buy that car, whatever the car is, you will know what your VMT is and it'll be based on what's coming out of the tailpipe, how many square meters you are, and I interestingly learned a new idea, concept flow rate because if you are two small cars, which are seven and a half, eight square meters each, it's kind of the same square meters as a bus, but you can picture that a bus takes up less flow space than two personal cars. And then it was pointed out to me, autonomous vehicles, they actually take up even less flow space because they can flow right up close to any car in front of them, not just autonomous ones. So we can think of this, how many square meters do you occupy on, high, on roads in our cities? That's the scarce resource, right? The scarcity is how much what is the flow put, throughput of metal boxes on our streets? So VMTs, to pay for infrastructure. Number two, curb access. In this new regime, which we're already seeing today, parking is no longer a policy tool. So parking is not a policy tool. We need to start charging for pickup, drop off, and delivery of, of curbs. And so let's start doing that. Let's start doing that. Um, and again, I'm only gonna charge you in a congested area. If it's not congested, I'm not charging. Like, it's, it's what we do, it's a market race based thing. And then lastly is con for congestion charging. Um, and because you're humans and you're great, you get one square yard for free. You all get one square yard for free. So I ride my bike, I'm not paying any congestion charge, I'm using a tiny little piece of space. When I choose to go in a car, which is eight square meters, I can have one square meter for free, and then the congestion charge will be set on 
1.3 people per car, because that's on average. I've changed my tune on this because I really don't want to have to get into how many people are in that car. I don't want to get into that privacy situation. So we're just going to charge you like you drive today. You're going to get your one square meter for free. You're driving a big car or a small car. I'll subtract that. Average occupancy of 1.4. Because it's fair user fees across all modes, if I'm a bus or if I'm Uber Lyft, Uber Pool or Lyft Line or Via or Chariot, I'm going to declare, I'm going to say, hey, you know what? I actually have eight people in this thing. I actually have 16 people in this thing. I actually have 60 people in this thing. And Jeff just pointed out to me, if I'm 60 people in that full 18 square meter bus, you know what? I'm going to be paid to get in there because I'm not even, I'm not even getting my square meter for free. So you there with your giant big car around, eight square meters, you're going to be paying a congestion charge, and I'm going to get, I'm going to get paid to get onto that bus during a peak time. So fair user fees across all modes. Number two, move cars, move people, not cars. We all know this. And number three, encourage efficient use of space and assets. This is from my friend Tim Papandreou, who I love. This is Market Street in San Francisco. So congestion can be congestion management, not always congestion charging. This is an example of congestion management in San Francisco. He's getting 60 people per lane per block in the bus. 40 people per lane per block in the bike lane, and yep, us in our personal cars, 12 people per lane per block. So we are moving, we are, the city is thinking about moving people and not cars, and it's encouraging efficient use of space and assets. I want to go back to this um, thing that I opened in the beginning. When you have a walkable and bikeable travel infrastructure, it's very distributed network. And so there's this large number of places I can go. And so now, when I'm evaluating where I want to live, my evaluation is not just my own little house where I go in these little places by my car. I have to value a much more, a much more um, robust bundle of goods. You know, where can I bike to in 15 minutes? Where can I walk to in 15 minutes? Where can I get to 30 minutes by subway? And yet, where can I get to 30 minutes by car? But this idea of substitutionability is profoundly different. So if we get people to adore and love this larger bundle when self-driving cars come, and they are point to point in that old fashion, there'll be much greater stickiness in communities that have been built out to be walkable and bikeable, because now I have to evaluate this whole big bundle of delight that I have, and not just this house versus that house. So what is the future of our transportation? It's going to be multimodal. And um, we'll have this large continuum of shared transport. And for me, when I talk about shared transport or shared vehicles, it goes from the metro all the way up to I'm rich and I'm renting my whole car by myself. Principle number eight, public benefits via open data. Why? Because we want to have interoperability between modes and we want to have competition within modes. When we move to this future, if we don't have public benefits via open data, we are going straight towards monopolies. Right? Because we know that in a transportation system, monopolies win. So this open data is my monopoly busting one. And it also does all sorts of great things for cities. And I see I threw across the bottom sharedstreets.io. I think they're doing some really great um, open data work. And so if you're interested, go look there. So um, this is a really beautiful sentence that I just got from someone who runs a small um, microtransit in Mexico. He wrote a blog on why is he joining the shared mobility principles. And I thought this was the most spectacular enunciation of why should autonomous vehicles be shared to begin with? Because if they aren't, they're expensive. And the wealthiest will be able to buy their autonomous vehicle and they'll be able to relax while the poorest will be forced to share the limited road space with a growing legion of zombie cars. So just think that through. I just thought, wow, it encapsulates, encapsulates exactly what we're talking about. I'm rich, I'm buying my AV Tesla, and because I'm human, I'm sending it out on all these useless, low-value trips, completely sucking up every single space there was left, while those of us who can't afford an autonomous AV are now left with an even worse situation than we were before. So these first ones really, really, really need to be, so, um, need to be shared. And so, yes, the principle number 10, which is among the most controversial, is autonomous vehicles in dense metro areas must be shared. And when I have this huge controversy, I do want to say these principles were so carefully crafted in wordsmith between cultures and uh, what's dense? So that is a question for us to define. What, is, what constitutes dense? And I was looking at the 10 most dense cities in the world. None of them are in the US. 
So we'll see what density requires, but I do believe that in Singapore and Hong Kong, we're not gonna be having personal cars. Like that is a crazy idea. So these shared principles for livable cities, if we build these right foundation stones, um, when we get to autonomous, it's gonna be fine. So we really have to focus on pricing right. You know, what's coming out of our tailpipe, efficient use of resources, fair user fees, the standard open APIs, and connected and integrated both the vehicles and the humans if we're going towards a very digital system. Um, you know what? There was this, I had this video teed up, but I don't know when I'm just gonna be showing it. Um, global infrastructure, I really never fail to talk about this. Our planet is, real destiny is infrastructure, right? That is the most fundamental of all of our infrastructures. And we really don't have any time to screw around with this global infrastructure. And so I'm gonna share with you um, this chart that gives me chills. So, is this year hotter or colder than the 20th century average? But on a planetary basis. If you've been born since 1980, you have never experienced a cooler than average year on the planet. You've only lived hot ones. And here's 2015, here's 2016, here's 2017. You can see we've almost already warmed the planet by one degree centigrade. Scientists are telling us that we will have a plus, plus five or six degrees centigrade by 2100 if we continue with business as usual. If you're like me, you have no idea what does it feel like to warm a planet by five or six degrees centigrade. Like, what does it feel like to live through that? So I did some research, and the last time we were minus four and a half degrees was the last ice age 20,000 years ago. And this is um, city skylines under ice under glaciers, so Toronto was under two meters of ice, Chicago under 900 meters, Boston a meter and a kilometer, Montreal three. So my bed in Boston, if you wanna know what does it feel like to warm a planet by four and a half degrees, that's the difference between Robin sleeping in Boston underneath a kilometer and a half of ice to today. That was four and a half degrees. We were going forward that amount in 85. So if you have any doubt that this is not the most incredible existential crisis that should be the number one thing we're focusing on, just, tell your, just remind yourself, North America and Europe under kilometers of ice 20,000 years ago to today. That was four and a half degrees. So our mission for all of us is to channel the tech-driven disruption in the mobility sector to rebuild cities that are sustainable, livable, and just. I feel like we are on these tectonic plates that everything is in motion right now in the transport sector, and it is going to firm up. It's definitely gonna firm up. Where it firms up has to positively, profoundly be on the side of clean, electric, sustainable, just shared cities. We cannot, we cannot let this go through this, this period of time without coming out on the right side of this. And I do think it's gonna happen in a five to 10, in a five year period from when the first ones come in. So this is just a picture of a very famous highway in Seoul called the Chungcheong Highway, and it was um, 12 lanes of traffic over a buried stream bed. And a mayor of that city who was very, um, who was willing to take on a challenge, he had to do a lot of fighting with a lot of people, and he unburied that and uncovered it and delivered this um, beautiful thing here. And he did go on to become president of the country. So it actually did work. So, you know, infrastructure is destiny. We do have to get this, this transition right. Um, so this video I produced uh, about a year and a half ago. It's really, really concise. If you want to find it for yourself and show it to all your friends and neighbors, um, you would look up Robin Chase, self-driving cars. But it's a really nice, short way of explaining the issues before us. Self-driving cars could make cities more livable, sustainable, equitable, and just. Fully automated self-driving cars will be available for sale in cities by 2020. They have very different economics than our current cars, and so won't fit in well with today's rules of play. I see two distinct possibilities for our automated car future, heaven or hell. We get to choose. Forward-thinking leadership is going to make all the difference. We get hell by taking a wait-and-see approach. In this future, people buy AVs instead of today's cars. For trips, once you get to your destination, instead of paying for parking downtown, it'll be cheaper to have your empty AV circle the block or drive back home. The same is true for stores. 
It could be cheaper to have a drugstore car drive to customers than to pay for retail space downtown. Today, 75% of all cars on the road have one occupant, the driver. In the future, as we add more cars operating with their different economics, 50% of the cars will have no people in them, running low-value errands or avoiding parking. Meanwhile, all the taxi, bus, shuttle, and truck drivers will lose their jobs. We'll also lose about 60% of our tax revenue that finances road infrastructure because AVs are electric, don't park, and don't get parking tickets. Our roads and bridges get a whole lot worse. We definitely don't want the hell scenario. We get heaven by taking a proactive approach. Over a million people in U.S. cities are already car sharing. And in San Francisco, 50% of the people using ride-hailing apps now share their trips with another passenger who is a stranger. Instead of spending $9,000 a year on your own car, when we combine car sharing and ride hailing and buy a seat in a shared autonomous vehicle, we can get door-to-door -door transport at the speed of private car travel for the cost of a subway ticket. This transforms people's access to opportunity. Car sharing eliminates the need for parking. Ride sharing reduces congestion. We will only need 10% of the cars we have in cities today, even at peak times. No more on-street parking, no more parking garages if most of the AVs in cities are shared cars in which people can share trips. We can widen sidewalks, plant trees, put in bike lanes and benches. We can get rid of parking lots and build affordable housing or public parks or whatever. Establishing the criteria and priorities for newly available public land will be critical to making sure communities get what they need. We could also reduce air pollution and CO2 emissions as we move from gas to electric power for our cars but only if we demand that this new incremental electric energy use be renewable. Happily, electric AVs will pay their fair share for road and bridge repair because we will have made and created new user fees that apply to them. We'll discourage empty zombie cars and make it more expensive to drive than to park. But wait, what about all those people who used to drive, repair cars, pump gas, design and build cars for a living? They worked hard and their jobs disappeared almost overnight. We need to make sure that people can diversify their income with benefits that are portable and apply no matter how few hours you work. And we need to start piloting basic income. So if we want heaven and not hell, we have to start working together to get the right laws and regulations in place now, especially for the first cities that set the example. Just as your head is reeling from the impact and potential for self-driving cars, realize that this is just the tip of the big automation iceberg. Automation delivers enormous productivity gains without the associated labor. It's like making honey without the worker bees. How will we distribute this new kind of honey? Automation gives us reason to reconsider how, why, and where we tax, and to think anew about what kind of world we want to live in. So let's talk. Please contact me. Thanks. That's what I got. <laughs>